Hello and welcome to episode three of the Yoga Live podcast with me, Kevin Boyle. I have my first guest on the show, Devon Kelly. Devon is a international movement coach based out in Yangshua, China. I'm going to give him a call now, so I hope you enjoyed the conversation and let's do this. Hey Devon, how's it going? Hey Kevin, great. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm good, man. Um... So where, where are you now? You're in Yangshou, is that right? Yep, that's right, Yangshou. And um, for those who don't know where that is, it's in um, southern Guangxi province, China, and um, which is, I don't know, maybe like a two-hour train ride from the border of Hong Kong. And what brought you there? Well, to China, generally, it was a job offer to teach full-time at a yoga studio in mm -hmm. Shanghai. Um, and which came to me through Instagram, uh, ironically, because Instagram is blocked in China. Um, oh, okay. And so, it, so one of the studios in Shanghai contacted me and asked if I wanted to come over for a trial period, and potentially start, like sign a longer term contract with them to teach full time for a year or more. So that's that's the initially how I opened that door. And mm. before that, I had never, <laughs> I never left the East Coast of the United States, more or less. All right. So it's quite. I, I was looking at your your um, your Instagram, and it's quite a rural area. Is it? Someone told me actually last week, because I was talking about you to someone else, that um, that's where they got the idea for Avatar because of all the mountains. Is that true? This um, well, there, there's different pieces of Avatar that were filmed in different places. But from what I what I understand, um, the part with the you know the big sort of prehistoric looking birds that that fly around the mount the 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 vertical um, precipices that was um, filmed in uh, a place called Zhangjiajie, uh, and Zhangjiajie is a different is a different area. Where where I am now in Guangxi is the um, the sort of um, limestone karst formations like like you might see in like Thailand or Vietnam near the coast. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, if you're if you're an anime fan, you know um, the original Dragon Ball series was mm -hmm. based on. Um, was was based on the novel Journey to the West, and if you look at the setting, which is a, China, a famous Chinese novel, um, and the character uh, Swan Wukong is Swan Wukong was uh, translated to Goku uh, in Japanese, and um, so but it's and there are obviously plot differences, but anyway the the setting of the story in the Japanese anime is this area. It's these sort of like. Um, yeah, if you've seen photos of from my Instagram page or something, you you know what the limestone formations look like, or you can just Google, Google um, Guilin, Guilin, China, and you'll and you'll see um, all the limestone formations here. It's it's quite a yeah, it's quite a place, and not really like anywhere else I've been before. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, it looks stunning, and it must be really nice and, and peaceful out there. I actually I lived in Korea for two years and. Um, Nothing like that, really. It was more in industrial area. I lived in a place called Ulsan, which is uh, that has the largest shipping yard in in the world. It's uh, Hyundai is is the main. That's where the Hyundai comes from, and um, it wasn't as beautiful as as where you are, um, but it was still a great experience. I think it's really uh, it's good to take yourself out of your your normal environment and put yourself somewhere where you're the foreigner, and uh, it gives you new perspective. Um, but um, so I should probably say actually how I heard about you. Um, so I was doing I was doing my three hundred hour teacher training, which I'm halfway through now, and I uh, so Dice Eda Klein and Brony Smythe are the the head trainers, and we started talking about the um, about yoga and about the the asana and the postures and why we do certain postures and alignment and movements that are good or maybe bad for the body and then one of the guys that I'm with uh, well, that was in, on the course named Paddy shout out to Paddy um, he um, he said oh, I'm a massive fan of this chap called Devin Kelly and then um, Dice chimed in by saying oh yeah he does really interesting stuff so that's why I first heard about you and um, and then Paddy said that um, you had a philosophy background or you interested in philosophy and um, how you tie that into your movement practice, but in a real accessible way. 
because um, I think what we were talked about on the course was how Instagram you see all these yogis on Instagram and they almost it's um, they give you one side of the story it's always the positive it's always um, you know yoga is great and feeling blessed and hashtag grateful and all that type of stuff but there's no um, talk about maybe what the limitations are of yoga or um, just general as they would say as they call it real talk and then that's when I started following Instagram and what I found really compelling was how you weren't afraid to be for want of a better word controversial and I think that Instagram is really good but giving one side of the story is not good for people's mental health they look at uh, someone's life and they think oh everything is or oh, everything's a certain way or the yoga industry is all perfect but I think it's healthy to have um, to strike a balance and that's what that's what um, got me interested in, in your work and um, and uh, and also uh, your uh, your intensity in, in your training as well I think is um, is, is really encouraging because I, I think that um, yoga only gets you so far in terms of a lot of stretching and that's fine to be flexible but I think strength is really important um, I made about three points there <laughs> but um, yeah that's yeah. what started me off and um, uh, in terms of um, knowing about you um, so um, so with that in mind when did you first start doing yoga yeah yeah so you know I took my first yoga class uh, in college when I was a runner and mm -hmm. um, really hated the experience I, I pulled a hamstring <laughs> during that class and and the um, and the instructor was not not really a, you know like a dedicated yoga instructor she was like sort of a fitness Zumba um, group fitness instructor and she came to teach a free class at at my college and I was recommended to go by my coach um, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure he didn't really know much about the um, I'm sure he didn't really know much about the the teacher but um, his intentions were good and um, I went and you know the teacher wasn't very qualified and I wasn't experienced at all and I was coming from an athletic background of um, really pushing my limits in terms of my my pain threshold so um, I was used to pushing that edge and you know did the, no surprise that I went into my first yoga class with the same mentality and ended up hurting myself and then I didn't go back to practice again for maybe another year and and that's when I tried a hot yoga class a hot vinyasa class mm. and um, and you know it was up my alley at the time because it, it felt challenging I was breathing hard um, my muscles were tired and um, I left with that sort of endorphin high um, and so I was like okay that was good you know I'll go back and do that I felt good felt like my body was opening um, didn't really think much deeper about it than that um, and then yeah so that's that's when I started somewhere around the, the tail end of college and um, and then from there it, I became pretty serious about it and um, started going every day and I guess like most fields I've been involved in I became almost obsessive over it um, which is later when when my when my act, the psychological element of my practice developed uh, is yeah. is a is a part of myself that I got to look at a lot more closely, um, yeah. So that was um, that development of my practice was was certainly um, important. When my when my practice turned, when, at least what I thought of as my yoga practice turned from from being focused on. Um, or centered around you know physical practice like the rest of my athletics had been and, and turned instead toward um, psychology and self-understanding mm. so and um, so what turned you away from it or do you still practice yoga as you we really know it in terms of you know standard warrior one warrior two vinyasa flows do you still do that no I, I don't at all um, and okay. the way that most people know yoga, I don't do any of that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't do sequenced flows um, that resemble yoga asana. I don't really practice any any yoga asana at all anymore. I don't even do headstand and shoulder stand anymore, um, which was all I was doing for quite some time until recently. 
Um, mm. So yeah, I pretty much left the the world of yoga asana behind, um, and you know, the, but I do travel a lot to teach at yoga studios because that's where a, a lot of my reputation has developed among the yoga communities um, around Asia and China. So I still have a lot of job opportunities there, and people hungry to learn. So when I go to show up at these yoga studios, in a way, um, I I feel that it helps people to access the practice if I make some of it look like yoga asana. So in terms of my own personal practice, there's not really um, anything that I would call in, I, I wouldn't say that it's in line at all with anything that people would think of when they um, when they refer to yoga asana. Um, okay. But in my teaching, because I, because I go to, to yoga spaces a lot and people who are involved in, in the yoga practice, um, I make what I'm doing look like yoga asana sometimes um, hmm. but it's but the approach is completely different yeah why did you decide to move away from the standard y yoga practice as we know it from a physical point of view well from the physical practice um, you know the, I guess I guess many reasons but um, the way The way I understood the physical practice, I, uh, idealistically, was as a gateway to self-understanding psycho-emotionally. Um, and so, like, for me, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't ever very attached to the, the way that was happening. Um, the particular methodology didn't, or, or the, the cultural... Um, setting whence it came wasn't really of a uh, particular concern to me um, in terms of the physical practice. Like I understand the philosophy that you can't di divorce yoga philosophy from its culture and its background. Um, but uh, in terms of the physical practice, as far as I'm concerned, the discussion can, can be had critically about whether or not those methods are effective or not. Um, you know, short term, long term, for different, um, for people with different pathologies, um, people with different inclinations, dispositions, um, physical limitations, um, and this stuff can be measured. You know, like it's not it's not a mystery anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, we're not no longer using a black box theory. Um, so it's just like for me, for me, um, be, and because I never really had that dogmatic attachment to to like you know quote tradition of the physical practice um i, I was okay i was it, it seemed like a very natural progression for me that when i found better methods of physical practice i just went there and the ones that weren't working or the ones that i saw in terms of the in terms of the literature and the and the and evidence in my own practice and my own teaching the stuff that wasn't working i had no qualms about moving away from that at all and i did that sort of ruthlessly and very rapidly at a certain point um yeah i think i think um people like to like routine and i think in order to create a new movement practice it, it takes creativity i mean it takes brain power and sometimes people just want to switch off and do a flow and um not necessarily think about what effect is having on their bodies and i'm really conscious of say with yoga you're constantly forward folding in your, when you do a sun salutation and you know there's only so many times you can lengthen your hamstrings before there's no benefit um so i'm i'm really aware of that and that's why I, i'm hoping from um look, looking at people like yourself that my physical practice can evolve um so in terms of your current physical um, practice what's what's the philosophy behind it if there is one um i wouldn't say that there's one coherent philosophy like i i don't think that i'm at that point in my life where it's yeah. all coalesced to that extent um, there for me right now there are many different ideas I'm considering simultaneously mm -hmm. um, and that's enough for me right now you know so like I go and I study with my teacher Miguel for example hand balance uh, yeah. or I'll go and study um, uh, Tai Chi with my teacher here in Yangshou or I'll go and study you know, dance or um, 
or you know what or gymnastics whatever I'm doing and whoever I'm learning it from I try to understand I, I guess if there's a if there's a methodology that I would say um, aptly uh, characterizes my practice it would be that I'm looking for learning principles that underlie um, any any discipline that I'm studying um, so, sort of like deeper currents of understanding and how how we learn how we develop patterns how we undeveloped patterns um, and yeah not just on the physical level but just you know in as many ways that I can possibly understand and so um, as a as an approach that gives me a lot of freedom um, to both go really deep into a discipline if I if I find that there's insight there mm -hmm. so there's there's nothing that's saying that I have to that I have to give up anything in a certain amount of time in order to in order to um, adhere to some generalist dogma, right? Like I don't, I don't care if I'm a generalist or a specialist per se in any given moment. Um, so I, I feel that my approach right now gives me the freedom to, to, to both go deep if I want to, spend some time on something, specialize in it for a minute, um, and then also gives me the freedom to not um, attach psycho-emotionally to... Um, to any of the practices and their dogmas, you know, because every every practice I feel like has um, has their own um, set of beliefs and approaches that are they that are sort of taken at at face value uncritically, um, and that's one. I mean, I don't want to name drop or anything, but that's one. And I and I haven't actually learned from Ido directly, but that's one reason I found Ido's work such a you know, such a mind fuck from the start, because um, his his approach opened the door to um, seeing that so many of these disciplines were like really only focused on skill acquisition and becoming better at the discipline itself. The end was always gymnasts get better at gymnastics, get better at these skills, and that's the end. Like, you know, what's the end? Olympic gold. Okay, well, you know, what's beyond that? Um, and he was the first person I'd ever encountered that asked that question like okay w what else is there and do I have to just care about getting better like at if I'm a dancer is there anything more than just getting better at dancing like what else is happening there and what's deeper and how do I yeah so that's and that's the reason I fell in love with yoga to start with too right because mm -hmm. it was a it was a discipline that for me was off offered my, the first sort of taste of a physical practice that was aimed at self-understanding um, and it was just a medium toward that and I was like wow well that's refreshing because you know and there's a sort of dissonance right um, between so we come from sitting at a desk for 12 to 20 years right and that's how we learn you sit passively you write um, listen um, watch and it's all like, and, and you know, read, and it's all done sitting down, without any sort of like motor interaction. Uh, there's not a whole lot of corporeal learning going on. So, um, so when I, in in, in the field of um, analytic philosophy and and value systems, which is what I studied in undergraduate school, basically philosophy and world religions, was. Um, was even more prevalent. It's just a bunch of people, you know, thinking about thinking essentially. And and then um, when I found yoga, it was like, well, okay, here's here's another modality of learning, and another way that we can use our entire being to sort of understand something instead of just instead of just sitting with the body passively and and running the mind in analytic circles. Um, yeah, I don't know. That, that was long-winded, but hopefully no, useful. Good, I don't know. No, that was good, man. That really resonates with me as well as someone who spent all their life sitting at a desk. Uh, I mean, I'm 36. I only started been teaching yoga or doing a physical job for the last year. So I spent 30, you know, most of my life at a desk, and I think uh, um, it's not natural. So, um, yeah. Um, so, so actually, I want to go back to something you said about the process of learning and mm. the one, one of the first instagram posts i read of yours 
was um, if you're not if you're a teacher and you don't practice regularly whether it be meditation or physical maybe stop calling yourself a teacher <laughs> so um, <laughs> I was like ooh <laughs> um, but um I was like, wow, okay, that's pretty powerful. And um, what I really liked about that is I feel that if you're constantly trying to evolve your physical practice, spiritual, whatever it is, if you're trying to evolve and essentially um, keep learning, then you're understanding what it's like to learn and the basic building blocks and the processes um, of learning and how we learn best. And I think doing that, system at doing that every day consistently or, you know, or not necessarily every day but um, regularly makes me anyway or a better teacher because i understand with them what it's like to learn something new and how to break that down and um mm. how, and so so with that i i haven't um obviously haven't been to any of your workshops what, what's your um your teaching method or do you have like a teaching um system philosophy that you um, you, you use when you do workshops like what happens in your workshops for example that's two questions <laughs> at once yeah well it it does it does vary and it depends a little bit on the audience but for the most part um, one thing that remains the same um, at least in the last few years a couple years of my of my teaching development has been that um, I get really specific about um and, and I slow things down at the most awkward and strange phases of the learning process because um, I think there's a huge there's just a, a huge amount of gold in there yeah. right at the point when things feel impossible and 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 discombobulated and the brain is really just trying to wrap first wrap itself around the question of what's what's happening and what needs to happen in order to accomplish a task um, I ask people to really slow down there and I and and look at what's happening and and then I give them some very simple very simple tools to transcend that awkward phase in, in, in as mindful a way as possible so that they so that not only they transcend that phase and they and they, they end up learning the skill but they in the process they understand something about how they did that yeah oh well when I you know when I was tossing the tennis ball this way in the air, um, I, I I noticed that there was a difference between the left and the right side, and and I, I made this correction in order to balance that out. And uh, okay, well, what does that mean in terms of the broader scheme of learning the skill? Um, like I, I I I try to encourage people to think critically at each point in that process, and so I ask a lot of questions while I'm teaching as well. That's a big that that's a big part of my methodology. I don't just I don't just spit information or tell people what to do. I try to get them actively engaged in answering questions along the way, um, which has been a real hell of a challenge for me in China because that's just not the culture here. Um, mm. To you know, they're especially especially here. They're just um, especially with people older than thirty too. They're just so used to being just just. Be, they're they're told to just be quiet and sit and accept the information all the way through school. So, and there's no it's all passive learning. There's really no active critical thinking going on. Um, so, that's been a, I think in in one way it's been it's sort of um, jaded me a little bit. <laughs> in another way, in another way it's um it's made me really sharp. You know, like I I think that that aspect of my teaching has really been strengthened through struggling through that process um yeah and i imagine trying to um, communicate with people whose english isn't their first language makes you a, a more effective communicator because your uh, the way you speak is not um you know it's not going to be too verbose you have to keep things quite simple and how you break it down mm, yeah it's made me really aware of of how i'm using language and why you know mostly why and it's like it, it, there's this moment when I'm like you know if I if I throw in some like complex um, uh, jargon or something at some point, and and the, and the translator is just at a loss, you know, I have to I have to, it, I'm forced to ask myself, well, 
why did I do that in the first place? You know, was it, and, and sometimes it was because I was trying to sound credible or, or I was trying to impress somebody or, you know, but, and, and sometimes it was just that I wasn't aware that that was part of my vernacular and that I assumed everybody knew what it meant. Um, and so in every case, it's just, it's been a huge opportunity for awareness in that regard. And I, you know, I really haven't figured it out. I haven't figured anything out. Um, it's still such a huge, um, there's just so much, even within that small area of like, you know, okay, how do I, how do I effectively ask questions that are going to, that are going to instigate people to think critically about their learning process while they're doing stuff? You know, what's even within that small framework, there's just so much that I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah. Um, and maybe figure out isn't the right word. Maybe there's nothing to figure out, you know. But there's, yeah, I'm just, it's just always a process. So, But I think the fact that you are thinking about this, and, and as you said, you're not just spitting out information one way uh, and you're asking the questions. I think that's really important because when I did the, the 300 hours teacher training, I, one thing I, I, I that really struck me was Dice and Brony. They are. I thought, okay, these guys are professional communicators. And then I thought, well, that's what a teacher is. That's a massive part mm-hmm. of the skill. Is your professional communicator. <laughs> so your words and the, how you use them are so important. And um, right, I was I was amazed by um, their skill. Uh, you know, because it's very easy to get caught up in the physical, the aesthetic. Oh, they can do all these cool things standing on one hand, but um, but how they spoke and and listened, it was unbelievable. I was like, wow, okay, this is an, another level. And then it got me thinking mm. about um, how I use my voice, and I think that's actually another reason. Well, I know that's another reason why podcasts interest me so much, because I um, am aware that of my physical limitations. And um, and I think that it's a slippery slope to go down when you're just trying to constantly um, outdo, um, you know, try and do the next impressive posture. And um, I, I, that's why I think conversation and communicating has become so interesting to me. And, I, and when you record yourself, when you actually listen back to yourself, you realize how many times you say um, how many times you say so, or as you said, when That's you right. use use words to essentially uh, make you sound more intelligent, but you're f- forgetting about the the listener or the student. Um, so, mm. so, see, I said so there again. <laughs> but I, I think I think um, it's it's really good to be aware of this, especially if you're you know you're a teacher, you're a professional communicator. Um, with that in mind, actually, I'm going slightly off topic here, um, but I wanted to ask your opinion on this. I, I, as you said, Instagram's great. You know, you got your job uh, where you are now, or you initially um, moved over to China through Instagram, and, and it's fantastic. But I'm really, um, I suppose, maybe concerned is the word about how uh, Instagram is all about the visual, um, and and also how yoga is um, is becoming like the new fitness industry. So they're tying in clothing brands and uh you have to buy this you know latest trinket for to make you more uh, what's the word i'm looking for um more awakened or something um and, and i i I'm, I think the I'm, te- technical term is woke as fuck right <laughs> that's it um more so woke. yeah okay they work um and I, and I, part of me, it's funny. I have part of me that's a bit like, man, I wanna, I wanna do this forever, as a li- not forever, but I wanna do this for the, for the immediate future as a living because I don't want to go back to what I was doing before in an office. I love interacting with people, teaching, sharing knowledge, that type of thing. And therefore, I think if someone offered me a sponsorship, it gives me credibility. It says, oh, Kevin Boyle is um, good enough to wear this clothing. Therefore, he's in this club. And um, so part of me mm. wants to get that exposure and that credibility, but the other part of me realizes how um, shallow that is and how um, I, that's what not, what, not what yoga is about. And, and I'm, I tried, I'm not a materialistic person at all. My house is, it looks like someone's just moved in here even though I've been living a year, there's like nothing in it essentially. Um, mm. So I'm just, I'm, I'm very conscious about how I navigate through the waters of Instagram and, and what I'm interested to ask you 
in a very long way is what your thoughts are on I suppose let, let's keep it to yoga so on the yoga industry I, I, even if it's just through Instagram hmm. um, two, I, I think I would approach this from two different angles um, number one in, in terms of like sponsorships and, and having the opportunity to broaden your platform hmm. I think it can be used with integrity like it depends obviously what you're selling for sure and I think it calls for a lot of awareness about what effect you're having when you have an influence over an audience and you're suggesting that they do something like wear clothes or, or you know like that there's always a consequence there and so um, and I think that that um, leverage as you as you mentioned like yeah for sure it, it, you, you know when you when you have access to a brand's network or something like this this gives you the potential to spread your message more or get noticed um, so that people hear what you're saying and I think that as long as what you're selling isn't misleading people um, or at least not too gravely you know or irrevocably misleading them um, and isn't confusing them about what practice means and you're and you're using um, and you're using that medium intentionally to then draw their attention to something deeper and yeah. more lasting, um, something that's going to create changes in behavioral traits long term, then yeah, you know, fine. I think that's, that's cool. Um, that, I don't know. I don't have all the answers here, but the, the second, the second, um, the second way I would, I, thing I would say is that it depends on where you're looking at this from so like yeah for sure some people might see you as more credible if you're sponsored by such and such clothing brand or or company or, or supplement company or backed by so and so but some people might not and mm -hmm. to some people it and, and also to, to a third group it doesn't even matter to them um, and so but to the to this to the second group who doesn't see this as a as a credit to you, um, there's even a potential for them to see it as a um, as a discredit. Um, so they like when I look at somebody, for example, unless I know them extremely well, um, generally when I see them sponsored by some you know clothing brand, it, it's it doesn't it doesn't elevate their what they're doing in my eyes. It it actually um, it actually detracts from their message. So. Mm -hmm. It, it, and, and I don't think I'm the smartest guy on earth so there are other people I'm sure who share that perspective and uh, um, and that that skepticism about brand sponsorship mm -hmm. and what that means for a teacher um, I'm sure there are other people thinking like me so I'm not the only one um, and so you know I th in terms of in terms of using a medium like Instagram or using brand sponsorship to get traction and leverage I really think um, Fuck that, you know. Like, there's a, there's a balance. Like, don't be blind. Mm -hmm. I don't, you, you know. It's obvious some of the stuff that's going on, and from looking at my Instagram page, you can see that I don't ignore it. Like, I'll call attention to it for sure. Yeah, um, and I don't want to spend all my time doing that. The majority of my time and effort is gonna be spent doing what I think works, and just ruthlessly doing that. You know, and and people see through it eventually. They do. Um, it it comes through at least to some people some of the time. It'll come through. And um, if if I just continue to be dedicated to improving what I'm doing and improving my craft with a sound intention behind it, with a, a valid and sound intention of um, of really improving people's quality of life, then. Yeah, I think, I just think there's no way that that's not going to come through to the people who really matter in the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't spend a whole lot of time, you know, worrying or it doesn't keep me awake at night where Instagram is going because in the end, it's just my tool. It's just another circumstance with which I can, um, yeah, it's just another tool I can use to, to do what I'm doing, you know, mm -hmm. and if it changes tomorrow, you know, if Instagram suddenly disappeared, I would still keep doing what I'm doing. And, mm -hmm. um, or if Instagram suddenly became twice as 
twice as um, uh, used as it is now, if it doubled in, in user accounts, I would still keep doing what I'm doing, you know, mm -hmm. and just continue to refine my, my process and continue to commit to integrity over and over and over again. Yeah. I don't know. That's just my, my thoughts on it. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's great. Um, and I think th that process of self inquiry and, and, and refining is, um, is really interesting. Um, because one of the other things I know, a lot of people do that do yoga are vegan. And if you ask them why they're vegan, um, they, some, they don't have, they have a kind of wishy washy answer. And this is something I've recently started doing in a vegan diet. Again, I was vegan before mm. and, um, I seen a post you made uh, a while ago about um, the fact that you were vegan and that you're not. So this is a massive, mm -hmm. a massive topic in in of itself. Um, what was it that? Well, I think my, what interests me most is why did you stop uh, and move away from veganism? Yeah. Well, I mean, so that the. the um, the easiest answer to that is that it just wasn't working. Like I, 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 my health wasn't good. I had all sorts of organ dysfunction and, and digestive issues and um, circulatory issues, skin problems. Mm. Um, in many ways, just my health was not where I wanted to be. I was, I was ill all the time. So I was getting viral infections um, quite frequently. At one, at one point, it was like eight times in a year. Um, and one of them was mononucleosis, which is not, um, which then set me up for further for further um, compromises in my immune system. What's, what's so mononucleosis? Sorry, the mono, mononucleosis virus is um, is um, yeah mono. It's just it's it's common in the U.S. I think many people go through it. It's um, but it's anyway it's an infection that makes you extremely tired and it, and it attacks your immune system immune cells directly i'm not i'm not super educated on the topic of mm. um of viral infection so I'm, i bad. might be saying some <laughs> some yeah i just i just know that mono yeah it, it compromises your immune system makes you very tired for a long period of mm. time sometimes up to like like six or eight months you can really um feel the effects of mono and i know that it stays in your system for a long period but um yeah anyway it's um it's 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 bad stuff but i had you know other just sort of like flu flu like viruses before that and after that um and so i attribute that largely to a combination of doing too much hot yoga and also you know i would say like 80 percent my my nutrition um and just not um yeah just not eating well um i was I was experimenting a lot during that period as well. Like I was trying, I tried all different kinds of stuff. I tried, I tried carb free. I tried uh, like 80% raw. I tried, you know, I read, um, I was reading some stuff on green smoothies back then and I was experimenting with that, doing raw green smoothies. And so I was just, I was drinking a whole lot of raw greens. Um, and, um, so it just wasn't it, it all it's hard to say exactly what it was that was mm. causing it because what i was doing wasn't really scientific in any way it wasn't very measured mm -hmm. um and so it's hard to isolate what variable was doing what yeah. um but i just know that over time when i started to take away stuff like i just went to like okay i'm not you know i'm not carb free anymore i'm just vegan all right i'm not vegan anymore i'm just um vegetarian all right i'm not vegetarian anymore i'm just pescatarian all right i'm not just pescatarian anymore now i eat red meat um so yeah. and and then that period of taking stuff away and eventually transitioning transitioning back into um eating animal products was when i started to really clearly measure stuff and pay attention because i was doing that because i had health problems so i was like i gotta figure this out because yeah. i feel like shit all the time my limbs are cold and falling asleep. My circulation's bad. My skin's bad. My digestion's bad. I'm getting sick all the time. And and I'd been an athlete my whole life. I, I really respected my health. And I saw it as um, something that was really important in my life. So I was really motivated to, to sort of um, to get some insight there. So I went heavy into the research during that period when I was healing. And um, started seeing, starting seeing all kinds of specialists 
from um, from nutrition specialists to to Chinese medicine doctors. Um, yeah, it was it was quite a journey. It took took a while, and now I, I feel like I'm finally in a place where I, I feel very balanced, and my um, my digestion is really great, better than it's ever been in my whole life for sure. Um, my strength is better than it's ever been in my whole life. No skin problems, no digestive issues, um, and no sleep problems. So I don't I, like I don't I, I'm not an expert in any of these fields actually, so I can't. I can't speak to exactly what, um, what is doing what, yeah. per se. But I can say that I figured something out, and it's um, some some things for myself at least. Not not for everybody, but definitely for myself. Well, it, yeah. I mean, it's like you, you said in, in your story the other day about you know experiments on mice can't be directly translated to humans because the variability between humans right. is so great, and therefore diet is very individual. So, w what's your diet like now? What what do you eat? As in, if you yeah. Mm, well, yeah. Um, well. So I don't. I, I stay away from gluten. Um, okay. Uh, but I do. I do eat it occasionally, just to make sure that I'm not building up an intolerance to it, mm. um, or an allergy. So I just I'll eat like a I, I don't know like a piece of bread now and again, or I'll eat. Um, you know, just something with some weed in it or whatever so that I can um, just test how I respond because for a while I was getting like severe diarrhea every time I would eat gluten. Um, and uh, now I feel like I'm in a place where if I want to have a hamburger with a bun on it, it's not going to, it's not going to wreck me for the whole day, you know? Right. Um, so that's, that's a good sign. So I keep testing that. But anyway, so I, I stay away from gluten. Um, I eat a, I eat a fair amount of meat every day, um, pretty much with Pretty much with every meal, I'm, I'm doing TRE right now, which I think you mentioned you're also doing, or yeah. intermittent fasting. <laughs> and um, um, so I don't eat for a significant portion of the of the evening and the day, six, 16 hours. Um, I'm on that sort of like six, uh, eight sixteen ratio, and um, yeah. so that's um, other than other than a, other than eating meat, high high quality meats regularly all fresh never preserved or like packaged meats um, mm. no like jerky or shit like that just um, as fresh as possible as local as possible and I make sure that I know where my, my meat sources are coming from so um, in China especially in these rural areas and also thanks to Taobao um, which is like sort of like the eBay or the Amazon of China mm. um, you can you can get meat from places where you know that the that the animal was lived well, like um, uh, that they were roaming freely in big open pastures in in northwest China or something like this, or or if if I get it locally, I know where the chicken what lived. You know, I know that it was roaming around the mountains out back, um, and just living a sort of, you know, um, yeah, very very much, very much natural life and eating its natural. Um, um, diet. So anyway, so yeah, that and I eat. Um, I eat some. I eat some carbs for sure, not in huge amounts, in moderate amounts, mostly mostly from rice um, mm. and some tubers, sweet potato, um, Chinese yams. Yeah, a um, lot of lot of vegetables, mostly cooked vegetables these days. I don't do a lot of raw vegetables. I would mm. say it's like 80-20 cooked to raw. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and I do uh, yogurt. I, I eat a lot of um, I eat a lot of fermented dairy. If I can, I get goat's milk yogurt. If mm. not, I do raw cow milk, uh, raw cow milk yogurt. And there's an Indian restaurant in town that actually makes it daily. Um, so. That in, in in China, there's not the same sort of regulations around pasteurization, so okay. uh, the the cultures sort of remain intact. Um, and raw yogurt, I think, in a lot of ways, has has saved my digestion mm. um, and really brought it back to my, you know sort of brought my gut biome back to a healthy, diverse state, um, and really back to optimal function over time. And because before I moved to China, just raw yogurt wasn't an option really. Um, so 
anyway so, yeah, that's some yeah. some things about what i eat interesting because my mind is open and um, i might get some hate for this um but um it really is uh, I, one thing i will notice from that particular post i referred to earlier was you talked about the weight gain you made when you started when you changed from a vegan back to what you're eating now and how you basically you, um, you imply that you've put on muscle and I'm, I'm conscious i mean part of it is vanity <laughs> as i get older and part of it is wanting to be stronger i mean i do a very physical job i'm very physical every day um and uh i want to um stay strong and have vitality um and and you you train read as you said um, when we first spoke you train you know you are quite um an intense person you train intensely as well the stuff you do is um is full on um so what and you mentioned that you you fast 16 hours so what is your what's like a typical day for you then in terms of waking up training eating uh yeah so i, I wake up um, i don't know maybe seven or eight and mm. de- depending I'm, I'm on a pretty relaxed schedule here it's when i'm not teaching mm. and then um and then i practice um for uh, you know, I wake up and I'll, I'll walk around. I'll answer any like really important stuff that I know, like like emails or coaching messages that I have um, lingering that I know I want to have a high cognitive function mm. while I'm answering. And uh, so I'll get those out of the way. And that maybe takes a half an hour or so. And then I'll practice for three to four hours in the morning um, before I do anything, before I, yeah, only water in the morning. Mm. Um, and... So and then and then I'll have my first meal at noon and usually, usually the morning practice is um, if I'm gonna do if I'm gonna do a strength session in the afternoon then I don't do a lot of strength in the morning I'll usually just do some like mobility work, um, some some stuff that I've taken from the FRC approach um, in the morning like cars pails rails and and then I'll do some cardio. Uh, in the morning like running or soccer or you know something like that and and then the strength will be in the afternoon or I'll just if I'm just going to do one session a day it'll usually because I'm highly focused on on strength basics right now Mm. and developing that sort of really strong foundation then um, I'll just if I'm going to do one session a day I'll just do a strength session in the morning Mm. Um, and then in the afternoon I'll do something light like I'll go for a walk or um, I'll, I'll focus on juggling or um, twice a week, I also play pickup soccer here with the with the other foreigners, um, and some of the locals. We we get together twice a week and just have a fun pickup game. So, yeah, um, or I'll do or I'll do climbing in the afternoon, something like that. I don't do I don't do a lot of sport climbing these days, um, just because honestly, it's scary. Like, <laughs> I get scared. You mean I, outdoors? I really do. Like, or y- indoors? Yeah, yeah, out outdoors. Oh yeah, bouldering's okay. not scary, <laughs> but um, <laughs> indoor bouldering—I mean, yeah. some bouldering can be real. Bouldering can be quite scary, but the um, but being up on a wall for me—I'm not afraid of heights. Like I'm, I'm not particularly afraid of heights. Never have been. But um, I've seen a lot of people get injured from like like minor falls in sport mm-hmm. climbing. Like they like bump their knee or they scrape their hip on a tufa or something like that, and. I don't. I don't really want those kind of superfluous injuries in my practice. Um, mm. It would sort of set me back. It might teach me something in terms of working around them, but it's not really something I want to be part of my regular thing. So um, I, I don't do a whole lot of sport climbing lately. I just I feel when I when I when I'm up there leading, I'm not I'm not experienced enough to know that I can fall well mm. every time, yeah. um, and and come away unscathed. Uh, so I haven't been doing as much of that lately, but I, it's a fascinating practice for sure. I have nothing against it. Um, mm-hmm. But for me, it's right now, um, I've been, I went on a couple climbs recently that just put the fear of God back in my heart. And I was like, fuck, oh. this is real. This is real stuff. And oh. I could die if something really or, or seriously injure myself irre- irrevocably um, mm-hmm. if something small goes wrong. So I, I don't know. I just in, instinctually I've, I've gravitated a little bit away from it. So. But if, if there were like an indoor bouldering place around here, I would do that more, uh, in, like in the in the afternoons or something. Yeah, I, I, this is, I think climbing or even pull ups. Um, I talk about this in class. is so important for people that just do yoga. Um, I know you do you do 
you know your physical practice involves pulling pull strength but um mm -hmm. i i think that's what the really great thing about climbing is that or if it's indoors and it's safe is that you um you're constantly <laughs> changing the variables the grips are different your hands are at different placements and you're pulling from different angles so i think um climbing is great i've actually never climbed outdoors and i've only just started recently climbing myself so um yeah i'm still getting getting the hang of it but i have no desire to go outside anytime soon especially in ireland because it's quite damp here and um it rains a lot so who knows mm. how grippy uh, the rocks are um but um yeah so you you mentioned about um how when you were eating um just going back to the veganism thing um about you were feeling tired so do you when you wake up um and you wake up quite early you you never nap during the day then yeah and it's not it's not because i have anything against napping i actually probably feel it would be beneficial <laughs> for me to nap um yeah. but no i don't I don't nap during the day. Um, okay. I'm open to exploring that, and in, in the future, maybe I might try on some like, some like one like thirty minute to one hour naps in the afternoon. Um, mm. But right now, no, I don't. I've never never really napped. And do you have a system for sleeping? <laughs> not not while I'm sleeping. No, I mean, um, you know, for a long time in my life, I had a lot of trouble falling asleep. Yeah. Sometimes it would take me three or four hours to fall asleep sometimes which um which kind of goes back to me not napping during the day you know i think um being such a high intensity high focus person mm -hmm. um like i mentioned to you earlier i've never fallen asleep while i'm reading never fallen asleep during a movie um mm -hmm. never um yeah not, not, never on a phone call or anything like that i'm just not the kind of person to to lose when, when I'm when I'm doing something or focused on something I can just go 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 for hours and uh, not really break that 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 focus chain so um, my mind has more trouble slowing down than it does staying focused mm. and um, that I think that led to um, some some real sleep issues over long term I ended up staying up late consistently because just couldn't fall asleep and then you know later and later and later and later day by day it would go um, and then I would just sleep in because I was an athlete and I um, I was very cognizant of, of how important sleep is for recovery so I would just sleep in until I was rested and it got progressively later and um, yeah it just formed a, a maladaptive habit over time uh, but so some of the things that really took me out of that were not um, not rituals while I was sleeping, but rituals around sleep, like around mm -hmm. my bedtime and when I was waking up. Mm -hmm. So um, particularly around bedtime, light is really important. So cutting off as much blue light as possible for like two to four hours before you sleep can be, can be really uh, effective. So if you have a phone that has like a night setting, turn the phone on, uh, the yellow light setting. Yeah. Um, where you can wear blue light blocking glasses if you if you can get those um, mm. on top of that, which can really help, especially if you live in a city and you're like you know you're exposed to a lot of like blue light that's sort of ambient around. Mm. Um, starting at like eight or nine o'clock, you can just put the glasses on, and then there's not a lot of a whole lot of blue light coming into your retina. Mm. Um, so I do that. I, I block as much blue light as possible during the evening, which increases melatonin production earlier and I just feel I feel sleepier earlier mm. um, and I also don't engage in high level cognitive tasks before sleep for like two two hours at least before sleep um, so I stopped responding to people on Instagram I stopped writing emails I stopped trying to journal or write stuff before bed um, even though I would produce a lot of high quality work during that time and my brain was capable of of going um, I just it, by changing that I, I, I really I think um, was able to to make it to make my sleep much more natural so that I don't have to do anything fancy or complicated during the night I just I lay down and now within 10 minutes of closing my eyes I'm asleep so and that's that's been huge for me where you know, coming coming from a person who you know imagine what it's like there if you if this is not you yourself just imagine what it's like to lay in bed for four hours just frustrated and trying to fall asleep almost every night yeah, um, to be able to fall asleep for 10 minutes is just 
just feels amazing <laughs> yeah yeah I, that's that's one thing i've noticed getting in the habit of is mm-hmm. looking at my phone before i go to bed um i, I have a habit now when i go to bed i have the phone in a separate room because i'm not maybe like yourself i'm not i don't set my alarm but i have to get up at a certain time um and so i have the phone outside the room so it's my morning routine is good i don't look at my phone but my evening routine i get home i'm replying to instagram things and essentially i'm looking at the screen that's the most important thing my eyes are looking at the the screen and um i'm really conscious of that and in fact that's a, a, a reason why i love podcasts because at least you're taking out the visual side of things you can just listen to a podcast while you while you're you know, cleaning the house or whatever before you go to bed and i find it um you're learning but you're not having to look at this little uh, s- screen you know um sure so you're um i noticed you um you bought all the gear for for doing a podcast like, do you plan to ever start one because I, as i said to you before you, you speak very well i think um, you would do a good podcast, if I may say. So, is it something you're you're planning to do sometime? Yeah, I, I appreciate the vote of confidence. I'm not <laughs> um, I'm not particularly set on having my own podcast channel, um, yeah. though I do like the idea of being able to put out high quality audio content on whatever medium that I'm using, whether it's mm. Instagram or my or my website that'll, that'll be coming up in in a while. I'm not sure when exactly because I've revised my my plans there in terms of like what I want to include. It's become a bigger project than I thought it was going to be um, when I initially um, started paying someone to to set everything up. But um, but yeah, so for now, I just I bought all the audio equipment so that when I do podcasts with people like yourself, the audio is higher quality on both ends and yeah. we can record independently. Um, I think that improves the experience because as you mentioned before, it's really annoying when it's when it sounds like one end is one end of the podcast is talking into a a shaky tin can that's continually <laughs> being cut off from sound so yeah yeah it makes a, it makes a big difference for me the audio um so cool man um when and are you planning to come to dublin anytime soon um well i had an Put invite you on the spot to cork there, sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, I had an invite to cork fairly recently um mm. and i would love to come to ireland i actually have ancestral heritage in ireland um my great great grandfather was from cork and Mm. um came here came came here not to china he came to the united states um on a boat got lost separated from his family never never connected with his family in the united states until like until he was married many years later um Mm. and already had children so yeah it was um i'm 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 fascinated with Ireland in many ways. I would love to come visit and and connect with the movement community there, as I understand is growing. So, yeah, yeah um, definitely. And Dublin, Dublin would be a would be a good place, as I as I hear. Yeah, no, Dublin's good. Dublin and Cork are the, are the two main cities, and um, yeah, it's like the pub culture here is dying, and the movement coffee culture is growing. <laughs> That's um, yeah. It's like the yoga movement studio. and coffee together, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like yoga or, or movement is the is the new church, and um, coffee is the new beer. So um, that's 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 what I think is the way things are going. But um, yeah, so it's always something, isn't it? Yeah, I know, man. Um, I'm off the coffee myself, actually. Are you? Do you drink coffee? No, no, I don't drink uh, any caffeine. Actually, I just it, I'm very sensitive to stuff like that, so I just don't like the way it makes me feel. Yeah, yeah, me too, man. I, I, I um, I'm the same way. I, I've substituted my coffee for napping, so uh, and it's going it's going well so far. But um, <laughs> yeah, De- Devin, man, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate that, man. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, man. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for the opportunity to talk to you and um, uh, and yeah talk about some stuff i really feel matters i love i love the podcast medium um for you know for the reason that you mentioned that it's so accessible and you can sort of do it while you're doing other stuff do it anytime so i really think podcasts are the future um and they'll continue to grow and grow i think you're on the right track yeah thanks so much man and you know if you ever come to dublin you got a place to stay with me and uh, maybe we could do another podcast but any questions you have if you're gonna come over and let me know man yeah i appreciate that thank you 
Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed it, please rate it five stars on iTunes and speak to you next week. Bye.